Greetings Guardians, my name is Bife here. Before we start today's lore video, I wanted to bring up a more somber topic that's been asked about a lot recently and give it a voice here in a video momentarily. As many of you saw from my video yesterday, I held a minute's silence before the video began to commemorate the passing of Lance Reddick, who was the voice actor behind Commander Zavala as well as the actor in many other beloved properties. He was also very much beloved by the community, and I wanted to take a second to answer a big request that a lot of you had, which was for a video commemorating the story and lore of Zavala in honour of Lance Reddick. My quick answer to this is that we will absolutely do this, but when the time is right. At this current point in time, I don't want to make a video because his death is very fresh, and because it feels like making hay out of that death of a very beloved figure. When the time is right, we will absolutely make a video that covers the topic, but that time is not now. However, if you do want to pay your respects both in Destiny and in real life, there are some things you can do. As well as taking a knee at Zavala in the tower for a few moments and contemplating the good that Lance Reddick has done by contributing something to all of our lives, you can equip the Push Forward emblem. You can find that in Collections Under Strikes. If not, other Vanguard emblems are being used as well. It's also worth noting the Push Forward emblem is special, because it holds the Cormorant Seal, which is featured prominently on Zavala's armor. If you have some money to spare, in real life, I know that Lance Reddick's family recently posted via his Twitter that you can give donations in his honor to momcares.org. We'll leave a link to that in the description for those of you who are feeling generous, and I'm gonna let Martin throw the actual link up on screen as well so that you have it there for a few moments. With all that said, that is my point on the topic. No video on Zavala just yet. This is too fresh. I don't think it's respectful just at this moment. With all of that said, let's return to our video. Today, we're going to be talking about the Acolytes of Nezarek once again, and we're talking about the story of an Elixni who suffered from madness, the likes of which we've not really seen in Destiny except for a few places namely the K-1 artifact and the nightmares on Luna. This is an Elixni who heard about the pillagers who went into Nezarek's pyramid and went there for himself. In that moment, he gazed upon the face of the disciple and final god of pain and was haunted from that day forth. This thief's name was Caraxus, and his horror is what we'll be exploring today. It's worth pointing out that this is yet more evidence of the twisted nature of Nezarek. The Scions, Humanity, and the Elixni have all had various run-ins with this god at this point, but if even looking upon his face is enough to mark you for his attentions, if it's enough to invoke madness in some manner, then Nezarek is a whole lot more dangerous than we might have originally thought. A Scionic power made to dominate the will of supplicants is one thing. A Scionic power that can haunt a person long after the matter is something entirely different. I want to point this out because we've done the raid and, well, that means we've all seen Nezarek's face too. We've been exposed to his power and we've even taken some of the items that have been imbued with that power, whether we've taken home armor or weapons. All of you people who are fond of Rufus's fury, well, I mean, think again. It might not necessarily be safe to use such weapons from a law perspective. I just want to throw it out there, because not only are we bringing back loot with us, we are bringing back nightmares and fear. And much as Nezarek is now dead once more, as the old saying goes, he might not be too dead to dream. My memory will never extinguish. In your calmest moments, your deepest slumber, you will remember me, Guardian. So, with that in mind, let's look at an example of what Nezarek's raw power from beyond death can look like. We're going to read the story of Caraxus in full, which can be found in the Hunter Raid Armor. This armor is known as the Trepidation Set, which, for those of you who don't know, means to feel fear or anxiety. Acolytes of Nezarek Caraxis The reef's labyrinth of asteroids and debris provided many a hideout for those who wished to be lost. 
and a potential gathering place for those that partook in less savoury acts. A large catch had set up among the debris on a random asteroid of its captain's choosing and had opened for business, supposedly as a bar. The music bumped the clientele, a Lixney pirate, were as rowdy as they were ruthless. Caraxis sat at a table with his head resting in his upper hands, his cup held in the lower. Exhausted, he hadn't taken a sip since he'd sat down, and he hadn't noticed that an imposing captain flanked by two smaller dregs had entered the bar. The captain started towards his table. Where's the relic? The captain, now towering over the table, chittered in their shared tongue. Caraxis visibly tensed and gripped his cup so tightly that the cloth woven around his palms strained. I don't have it, he responded. Before Caraxis could register what happened, the captain snatched him from his seat. Despite being loosely labeled captain by his crew, Caraxis was nowhere near the size of the elixir before him. His feet dangled in the air. Pathetic. Not worthy of your crew. You're right, Caraxis agreed, defeat evident in his tone. The captain's words were venomous, but not as impactful as the fist that collided with Caraxis's face. The other patrons scattered, a blur of fists and insults erupted. A faint chorus of ethereal laughter swelled beneath the violent chaos. The slow drag of Caraxis's injured leg made the trek back to his empty ship longer than it had been before. Persistent exhaustion made itself known between each pang of pain that jolted through him. He was thankful the captain's beating had been interrupted by another patron's fist long enough for him to skitter away, but the paranoia of being tracked lingered. It felt as if an unseen force hovered behind him. Caraxis pushed onward and kept his gaze forward. When he finally made it to his ship, the airlock hissed open and revealed a dark space within. He ignored his usual precautions, too focused on the unbearable pain in his limbs. The hammock he'd fashioned for himself called to him. He collapsed into it and didn't exhale until he found a comfortable enough position. Sleep found him as soon as he'd closed his eyes, the fastest he'd achieved it in days. Forced insomnia and a surprise beating had taken its toll. Then, there was a knock on the door. The moment Caraxis heard the rap on the metal, he reached for the gun on the shelf beside his hammock. He approached the door with the most delicate footsteps he could manage, a heaviness weighed down on every part of him. He hesitated, eyes fixed on the rusted metal. Rap, tap, tap went the door. The door creaked open, and he immediately aimed down sights at… nothing. Confusion crept into his mind, as something hit him, hard. Caraxis scrunched his four eyes shut. He was flung backward and braced for impact, but it never came. Caraxis opened his eyes, expecting to see the walls of his catch. Instead, he saw the lunar pyramid, sleek and dark. Caraxis instinctively moved toward the pyramid, an echo of a journey he wanted desperately to forget. The pyramid peeked over the edge of the chasm, a foreboding sight. It was complemented by a stillness that filled the area and made him feel as if he were on the edge of suffocating. He remembered how he carefully traversed the jagged paths. It seemed as if the pyramid was pulling him in. Everything felt familiar including the paranoia. But something was off. The architecture wobbled and shifted with every step he took. Statues felt as though their heads turned to watch him. Faint whispers danced around the rooms and faded before they could be comprehended. The air was thick with anxious anticipation, with fear. Caraxis retread familiar hallways and staircases until suddenly, without realizing, he stepped into the innermost chamber. His chamber. 
The whispers grew louder as he approached the body, slumped over and shrouded in shadow at the center of the room. Hisses, yells, and fervent but unintelligible phrases all blended as Caraxes moved closer. The corpse had been picked clean, barely anything left outside the vague shape of a body underneath the cloak. Be it the threat of curses or sheer fear, his head remained untouched. The whispers grew louder the closer Caraxes got to the entity's face. His body shook as he stared down at the darkened helmet, a ring of eyes pronounced even in the low light. Despite the same dread that filled him, Caraxes followed through with the familiar actions and carefully removed one of the eyes. The room shook violently, and before he could safely stow the piece away, Caraxes toppled over. He closed his eyes and braced for impact. The energy of the crew bustled. Caraxes opened his eyes, revealing the vastness of space beyond the nearby porthole and a dozen or so elixni partaking in various activities. The air was heavy with tension, hushed tones, and cautious movements as they maneuvered around the decks. Caraxes was quiet, as he had been the first time, the weight and power of the item he'd liberated heavy in his palm. It pulsed. The world had changed. Another familiar moment. Things aren't looking well, Captain, a dreg whispered to Caraxes. He remembered this conversation, but didn't recognize the dreg's deep tone. It sounded out of place. The dreg leaned a bit closer, eyes darting between his shipmates. Our food is low, the ship needs repairs, and the crew is worried it might be cursed. Then they can leave, Caraxes snapped. It was automatic, much like his trek through the pyramid. The dreg hesitated in surprise. Caraxes blinked, no longer surrounded by his crew and their voices of discontent. He suddenly found himself in his quarters. It was dark, the type of darkness that felt as if it would devour him. Caraxes sat at the table by his hammock, just him and the eye. He stared at it, and it stared back. A book of magic lay beside it, a frantic solution to an unexpected problem. The ritual was simple, or so he thought. He was barely able to translate the text on his own, but was too stubborn, too scared to ask for help. He grasped a pointed crystal in his hands. Words left his mouth, but he couldn't hear them over the incessant whispers. The crystal glowed, and Caraxes was met with an energy blast that propelled him backwards. This time, he felt the impact. The whispers and screams drilled into Caraxes' mind. He lifted his hands to his face. Whimpers and pitiful chitters were the only sounds that escaped him. Again, the scenery around him had shifted, and he stood on the edge of a meteorite. Though the reef was vast, he recognized the ship debris flowing past him. But it was different than he remembered. Twisted in horrifying shapes, the deep purples and blues were dimmed. It was quiet, save for his own personal audience. Caraxes held up the eye in his deteriorated hands. It still pulsed with energy. Free me. He heard the allure. A voice seducing his soul to do its bidding, but the distortion that followed it reminded Caraxes why he'd come to this place. An untraceable end for this cursed relic. He balled his fist around the eye. The screams pierced his ears as they grew louder. A dark hand reached out to him, fingers inches from his arm. Caraxes flung the eye into the reef with all the strength he could muster. He collapsed. And then... A knock on the door. Caraxes jolted awake, hand already outstretched to grab his gun. The whispers were gone, his quarters were quiet. He gazed around the room, dazed. Caraxes stumbled out of bed and delicately approached the door. He aimed down his sights. The metal door creaked open. Outside was a human, 
dressed in a dark, ornate cloak. One hand raised in greeting, the other tightly holding a tome. It gave off the same nightmarish energy as the eye, as Nezarek. Apologies for disturbing your sleep, said the man in a tongue Caraxlis loosely understood. But would you happen to be Caraxis? Caraxus' experience with Nezarek is one that we really shouldn't underestimate. It is proof of how effectively even a dead and dismembered Nezarek can influence the world and those within it. There are some troubling things that we really should account for in this story, the first and most obvious of which is that there seems to be an Eye of Nezarek out there somewhere in the world floating through space, and seemingly, Nezarek wanted it there. The implications of that are highly disturbing. Our best case scenario here is that Nezarek is aware of the power that any dismembered part of him has. By throwing it out into the universe and into the reef, Nezarek might have hoped that it'd simply float until it landed in the possession of some other unfortunate soul, be that through searching, planet fall, or sheer bad luck. Whenever the eye is claimed, it is presumably the case that Nezarek will be able to haunt this individual and to extend his influence even further. This, as a reminder, is probably the best case scenario. The worst case scenario is that Nezarek has a degree of prescience. If Nezarek can see into the future to a limited degree, then Caraxes has played a part in an even greater plan that the God of Pain had devised. We cannot know what this plan might have been if Nezarek is even slightly prescient, but if there was one, it almost certainly will help to ensure that Nezarek claims a powerful bounty of dread and pain. There may, however, be an even grander play that Nezarek is making here. If it is the case that we're looking at Nezarek dispersing an object tied to himself into the universe, it may be the case that he is trying yet again to find a way to be resurrected. At current, we don't know what it would take for him to be resurrected outside of the context of the Traveler's power. However, it doesn't mean that that power doesn't exist, and if there is a means on some other world to bring the Disciple back, then perhaps that is where the Eye Caraxes stole will slowly be headed to. Again, that makes a rather bold assumption which is that Nezarek does have a degree of prescience, which is completely unfounded and unproven, but not impossible considering the powers of other disciples of the Witness. It's also worth noting that there might be a simple answer to whatever's going on here, which is that we are in possession of this Eye of Nezarek. Take a look at the Warlock Bond that comes from the raid, and then take a look at the Eyes of Nezarek that have been placed on his helmet. And suddenly, you can start to realize where the similarity might lie. Nezarek's eyes may in fact be on us at this moment in time, and if that is the case, well, we may be in a great degree of trouble. But there are other things that we need to account to. Take, for example, the fact that Caraxes had a book of rituals and magics. If this book is anything close to a copy of the cultists' practices from the Acolytes of Nezarek, it's both dangerous and in our best interests to acquire it. Whether we use the knowledge gleaned as a way of determining a weakness in Nezarek's power, or whether we simply destroy the book to prevent further damage is a discussion for later. Its acquisition and the acquisition of other tomes and powerful artifacts related to Nezarek is of similar paramount importance. I do believe that the book is in a human tongue, given that Caraxes had trouble translating it. If this was a copy of Of Hated Nezarek, though, then this raises even further questions when it comes to the acolyte that Caraxes met at the very end of the story. If Caraxes was holding a copy of Of Hated Nezarek, then what makes the copy held by Michael, or if this wasn't Michael, the acolyte in question, that much more powerful? Once again, I'm going to presume that this is Michael reaching out to Caraxes in this moment. Not only does it fit with his pattern of trying to find individuals who have been touched by Nezarek in some manner, but also the book seems to be a great giveaway. Remember that Michael's family has used their book for generations to contact Nezarek and to invoke him in rituals. 
And there is something strange, therefore, about the fact that Caraxes's book does not seem to contain the same dreadful power as the one held by Michael and his family. Maybe it's the case that because of the generational ties, this book has been invoked so many times in Nazarek's name that it now has been imbued with a certain degree of his dark power, some terrible dread that hangs on it like a miasma. The reality is that we don't know what any of these books are, but the likelihood of at least one of them being a copy of of hated Nezarek grows every single time I think we reread one bit of the story. Again, whilst it is never confirmed, it is something worth remembering. Pre-Golden Age texts involving Nezarek existed for a long time, and therefore it's not impossible that some of these relics are ancient. After this point in time, Caraxes isn't heard from again, save for the flavor text of his weapon, Caraxes's distress, which reads, I cannot sleep. His gaze, it lingers at every corner of my mind. Caraxes, acolyte of Nezarek. This flavor text implies that Caraxes was not only invited to join the acolytes of Nezarek, but that he did so. Keep in mind that Caraxes' weapon identifies him as an acolyte, whereas Acacia's weapon, Acacia's dejection, does not and seems to signal that she fled the cultists instead. Whatever happened to Caraxes from that moment onwards, our best guess is that he is now in the company of those whose lives have been twisted by fear. The stories are as different as they are, the reasons for joining are also as unique. From Michael and his family that openly embraced the god of pain, to Caraxes who joined out of fear, all of them have endured the assault on their will that the god of pain has wrought. But even those of strong will are not immune to the whims of Nezarek. Next time, we'll learn about how Nezarek's corruption, his nightmares, his fear and his pain can also haunt us, the Guardians. We are not immune from this scourge. Fear and nightmares are common to everyone, even those blessed with the power of the light. But that is where we're ending our video today. Thank you so much for watching, and if you did enjoy the video, I would normally tell you to go ahead and leave a like, and to subscribe and all the other things, but in this instance, my special request is to do something to honor Lance Reddick. Go ahead and take a look at the momcares.org website if you have money to give. And also, if you don't have money to give, maybe take a moment to remember him in the tower. Or run some vanguard strikes and ops in order to honor his memory. Regardless of what you do, thank you so much for being a part of the community. And thank you for being a part of honoring the memory of our commander. But as per usual, my name has been My Name is Bife. Rodasia Arastra. I'll see you, Starside. <laughs>